Anyway, everybody, welcome to the to the uh, Paranormal Peeps podcast. We appreciate you uh, tuning in uh, and listening to all of our uh, our silliness and our hopefully fun uh, paranormal experiences. Uh, we have a great show for you tonight. Uh, before we jump into the topics, let's let's announce who we who are we who's here. Uh, to my right, we have the lovely Terry. I'm Terry. <laughs> she, she's <laughs> <of> my wife. <laughs> and, then, and then we have Jamie. Yep, that's Say me. He- hello. <laughs> Josh. Josh over there. And then Lisa. The lovely Lisa. And I'm Mike. Lord Mike. You're the most annoying one. Yes. Anyway, so uh, tonight we have a, a, a kind of a wide variety of topics. It started off as one topic, and then we've all just kind of grown. <laughs> and so there's kind of a, a hodgepodge of things coming together, but they all kind of have a central, central thing, I think. Yeah, or relate so somehow related maybe, or if, if they're not, then I don't know. You can, you can always fast forward, or you can mute it and take your headphones off when I'm speaking. Um, but uh, we were going to talk about uh, dead celebrities, not just dead celebrities because every celebrity dies, but you know, ghost sightings and some of the things about that. But there's so many other, so many aspects of that we can we can explore. And so, um, do you want to talk? Do you want to introduce what everybody's going to talk touch on or? You just want to make them listen. Let's just dive right in. Dive right in, Terry. How about you start us off? Uh, what do you want? What do you want to share with the people? Okay, so mine's not so much like ghost sightings. Mine is more like um, myths and deaths and uh, paranormal experiences with movies. Because like Hollywood is so deeply known as being a haunted place. And you really can't step foot in Tinseltown without hearing stories about death or ghosts or something of supernatural lore. So I know most of you out there have heard the story of Wizard Oz, that there was a death in the background of either a munchkin. Some say it was a stage hand that fell and hung himself. Alien. <laughs> it's always an alien it's tradition. Um, and so... With the movie being released and being people being able to watch it at home and be able to slow motion it and go scene by scene, this myth got bigger and bigger. And sadly, it's not true. Josh is very disappointed in this. I'm highly disappointed. <laughs> also, I've never seen. I mean, I Wait. have taken the time to Wait. try to see it, and I've never seen Josh, it. You've never you've seen never it. Never seen the movie. No, so I've seen choose, the movie. Okay, as I say, choose your words very carefully here. But I haven't seen the scene in which she's referring to. Okay. I've tried. I, I will, just have never seen it. I will send you videos to watch. Okay. So when this scene was filmed, the Munchkin Land scenes hadn't even been filmed yet. So nobody from that scene would have been on set. So there's no way it could have been a Munchkin. And then if it was a stagehand, oh, we found the cat. We have an evil cat <laughs> hiding in the rafters. If it was a stagehand that had fell, that had fell, then how come no one in the scene reacted to it? They all just kept on going like nothing happened. So you think that it, if something like that had happened, people would have reacted to it. Um, but what it really is, is to give that scene a more outdoors feel, several birds of various sizes were borrowed from the Los Angeles Zoo to just roam the set. And there's actually a scene where a peacock can be seen um, outside the Tin Woodsman's shack when Dorothy and Iscaro attempt to revive him. So what you actually see is a large bird said to be either an emu or a crane and not somebody hung in the background. It's just a bird. But the bird... But that, like, The bird hung itself. The, the bird, <laughs> the bird, well, that makes sense then. Like, dude, bird the side, emu. You um, laugh, but bird suicides are a real thing. And it's, <laughs> it's no laughing matter. Yeah, I may have witnessed one or two of those. <laughs> so, and it, it's, there, there was a, a clip that I watched where you could see like the original film of it, and then where they digitally remastered it, and so you can see it much more clear that it is actually a bird. Oh, so it's it was really crazy to watch all these videos that I was watching. That's really cool. It is also really sad because I. I Remember all of the stories of it being like the munchkin that committed suicide. And then um, I heard, I can't remember if it was a documentary or something like that, that I watched. I talked about it. It was actually a stagehand that, that was up in the, the rafters or the catwalk and tripped on a cord and 
and and uh, fell and hung himself on on that. So because yeah, that's what I thought it was too. And then when I started doing the research, I was like, oh no, it's not it's just a bird. Or Snopes is wrong, and it really is yeah. a dead munchkin. Maybe it is. Could be. It's a cover up. Has anyone fact checked the fact checker? True. I uh, know. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> they don't like being fact checked. Okay, so then another movie that hopefully you guys have all seen is The Poltergeist. Now, this one has got a lot of like mysterious things surrounding it. And a lot of people think that it was all started because they used real human skeletons in this film. What was that? Was that the cat again? Probably. <laughs> I don't know. We got a for rafter the, cat. For those of you at home, there are evil rafter cats. Okay, they're not evil. <laughs> Instead of raptor, it's did rafter you, cat. Like, did you say rafter or raptor? <laughs> rafter cat, like Either a raptor. One. Either one. They, they pounce and they'll get you. I'm waiting okay. for one to drop down on the table. In front of us. <laughs> okay, so there is a scene in the first movie where the mom gets dragged into the swimming pool, and it's full of skeletons that were buried under the house that the family didn't know was buried under the house, and they had actually used real skeletons in this scene. And nobody knew. The actors didn't know. The stagehand, the crew, they didn't know they were real skeletons. Um, she, the actress, um, Jo Beth Williams, actually thought that they were made out of plastic and rubber. Um, but it was confirmed by the special makeup artist, um, Craig Reardon, that they got 13 actual biological surgical skeletons, the ones that are like hung up in like classrooms for teaching and biology and stuff like that. And the bones were acquired from India. And then him as the makeup artist, dressed them to look like they were um, disintegrating cadavers. <laughs> oh, gross. This is not the thing I'd want to be in. I don't know. Why 13? Why 13, right? Yeah. Coincidence. So, I mean, for I me, if I was... And, and they were saying this film took like four or five days to film. And so this actress was in this mud pit with these real skeletons. Gross. Not knowing they were real skeletons. Like, that was just, that's just gross to me. Yeah. <laughs> she was in the pool. <laughs> so a lot of people think that that is what started the curse with the Poltergeist film series. Because then in, so also in that movie, the son, um, his name, the actor was Oliver Robin. He nearly died during the filming being choked by the evil puppet, clown puppet. And it was Steven Spielberg that actually came and saved him from being choked during you the can't filming. can't trust those evil clown wow. puppets, I'm telling you. <laughs> he was controlling the puppet. Right, how have... would it be to say Steven Spielberg saved my life? Right? From an evil what? clown puppet. <laughs> <laughs> That's the part that seems a little bit strange, right? But, like, puppets got to be controlled by somebody. So who was controlling the puppet trying to choke this kid out and then just like, well, they got away from me? <laughs> oh, jeez. So, and then on the second Poltergeist film, the cast and crew were really on edge during this filming, concerned about, you know, the curse following them from the first film. So they actually performed an exorcism on the set. Funny thing, this exorcism was done in the dead of the middle of the night by one person and nobody else was there when it was done. Tell me it was the specter guy with the, with the, with the black hat. No, it was... That's the bad guy from it the was, movie. No. It was an actor, his name is Will Sampson, and he played the shaman, Taylor, in the movie. So he was the big Indian guy. Okay. Um, so when the cast and crew came back the next morning, they said they, that everything felt relieved on the set, and so they figured that the exorcism was a success. Whether so, he actually performed an exorcism, nobody really knows, because nobody was there. So the exorcism what was, on what? The set. On the set. Uh, just uh, for, yeah. For like, the set. For the set. So, um, then you have like all the deaths that happen from this film. So in the first film, you have the older daughter, Dominique, Dominique Dunn. Um, shortly after the film was released, she was strangled by an abusive ex-boyfriend. And then after being in a coma for five days, she passed away and he was convicted for manslaughter. Obviously (laughs) he served six years for her death. Wait. That's it. That's that's it. awful. Yeah. Like that's not manslaughter. Yeah. It's like oh, like manslaughter is an accidental. He, he death. accidentally strangled her. <laughs> <laughs> so that oh was my. the older daughter, and then you have the girl who played Carol Ann, Heather O'Rourke. O'Rourke. Um, she actually became ill four months before the release of the third movie, and she died of cardiac arrest and septic shock 
from an undiagnosed Crohn's disease. She was only 12 when she passed away. Um, in the second film, um, the guy who played Kane. That's the bad guy with yeah, the hat. Yeah, the bad guy with the hat. Yeah. His, his name was Julianne Beck. Um, he died of cancer, although he was already diagnosed with it when he took the role. And so that's part of the reason why he looks so creepy is because he was going through all of his chemotherapy while they were filming that. Mm, I didn't know that. No makeup required. <laughs> and then you go back to the guy who performed the exorcism, Will Sampson. He died of complications of a heart-lung transplant. And then lastly, um, there was a guy named Lou Perryman who played Pugsley in the first film who was brutally murdered by an ex-convent. Convent? Convent. Convent. <laughs> I think the convent's funny. <laughs> I do too. An ex-convict. So that's everything with um, the Poltergeist movies. Hey, but Craig T. Nelson's still alive, and that's important because he's the coach. <laughs> that's so, right. I like him. I do have to ask this. Like, who's watched that movie recently? I kind of have. I like have within like, like at least the two last two years I've seen it. Yeah, what do you call recent? Well, wait, what's your question? No, I'm just wondering because like the same year. No, like just this year? like who's like seen it recently? Because I've seen the movie one time when I was six. Oh, I've well, no. never watched it again. It scared the crap out of me when I was six, and I've never watched it again. You want to know the one thing that really bothers me about that movie what? is the parents get high in that movie, and I'm like, wait a second. So how huh. is this really happening? Or are the parents just high and like? seeing stuff because they're high <laughs> wow maybe it's, it's it's really just a big old bad acid trip the other thing that kills me is like when she's putting the daughter on the floor and she's sliding and she keeps doing it over and over i'm like come on why are you still like, doing this get out of the house check this out this is so cool <laughs> <laughs> and she puts the helmet on her and like slides across the floor i'm like why are you no. still in this house get out <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so to to be honest, at one point, like Josh, I would have been scared to death. Now, if stuff like this was happening in our house now, i, I got to be honest, I'd be like, do it again. <laughs> do it again. <laughs> I don't know, I'd put my daughter on there, but I'd be definitely, maybe, maybe the dog. <laughs> dog on a skateboard. <laughs> so, and then the last one I have is Rosemary's Baby. This is one that we still have not seen. No, I still haven't seen this we one. We have it recorded in our DVR, but we just haven't watched it yet. But uh, the story of this one is where an actor agrees to give up his wife's womb to Satan so he can have a taste of fame, only to find out that it ends up being the spawn of Satan. Because <laughs> that sounds like a great <laughs> right? idea. And he's, wow. so, and he's famous for being killed by the spawn of Satan? I don't know. <laughs> no. It's like, you know, instead of selling your soul to the devil, you're just going to sell your wife's womb and your baby to the devil. <laughs> Did she have a say in it or just like, <laughs> hey, you know what? My wife's available. Like, <laughs> give me some money. Let's see, I don't know. I haven't seen it. I, I, if I understand, I don't think she knew what was going on. Yeah, I don't think the, the, the his wife knew what was going on in the movie. But the part of the movie was filmed in front of one of the most famous New York buildings. It's called the Dakota. The Dakota. It was the exterior of the apartment. Um, it was also the site of where John Lennon was brutally shot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll circle back around to that later in the episode. Um, but the producer claims that the whole time he was on set at the apartment building, he always felt like a really eerie filming. Filling, not filming, filling. And then at the age of 38, the composer, the guy who wrote the score, fell off of a cliff in Los Angeles, suffered a cerebral hemorrhage just months after completing his work on the film. And then after the fall, he went to a coma and then passed away. And the eerie thing about this is this is the exact thing happened to Rosemary's friend Hutch that's in the film. Creepy, right? No kidding. Dang. Mm. So another couple things that happened during this film. The actress who played Rosemary, Mia Farrow, was served divorce papers from Saint Frank Sinatra while on the set. Um, the producer, William Castle, had kidney failure. Another producer, Robert Evans actually suffered a stroke while doing a speech in honor of the, the late director, Wes Craven. The person who had the most hardest time out of this Rosemary's Baby was the director, Roman Polanski. And that goes into what That's where I come to in. talk about. 
Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, Charles Manson and the murders and how all of this came about. So uh, Charles Manson was a racist man, and he wanted to be a ruler over uh, black people. So he created his own cult out of about 50 followers, and most, most of them were women. And um, in his cult, he would pay off men to live in homes and to try to make music by using his women. He convinced one of his songs to be sung by the Beatles, and they changed it from blues to their pop style and renamed it and didn't give him any credit for it. And he just The became, Beatles or the Beach Boys? Maybe it's Beach Boys. It was the Beach Boys, I Beach thought. Boys. I just he wrote was, Beatles. He was friends with Dennis Wilson. Yeah. Yeah, it was the Beach Boys. Yeah, yeah Beach Boys. Thank you. So, Sorry. um So he... Beca- there, there is a connection to the Beatles, though. We can get back to that. Okay. Um, so... Can I interrupt you again? No. Jeez. <laughs> <Chase. Jeez. laughs> oh, okay. Proceed. <laughs> no, go for it. I just wanted to interrupt you. You're rude. <laughs> I, could, I could tell you're like, geez, let me talk. <laughs> I'm sorry, Elisa. It's okay. <laughs> All right. Let me get back to this. Um, anyway, he, um, also... Lost. He got. Kicked, he lost his home. He got kicked out of his home in Hollywood, um, and was denied any ability to record. So he, Manson, got really mad. So keep that in mind. So um, the record producer that denied Manson of this, um, they were friends, and he ended up moving out of his home. They stopped being friends um, on Celio Drive, and. Sharon Tate and her husband, a film director, which is Roman Polanski, moved in. Um, And then on August 8th, Sharon Tate was 26 and eight and a half months pregnant with her first baby. And her husband was out of town filming. So he had her friends come and stay with her. And the occupants of the house in that evening, um, so it was Sharon Tate, her friend and former lover, Jay Sebring, um, Polanski's friend and uh, an inspiring screenwriter. I don't even know how to say his first name, but his last name is Frykowski. Um, and then Frykowski's girlfriend. She is Abigail Folger. She was an heiress to the Folger's Coffee. Um, so anyway, um, that specific house was chosen by Manson because both... Um, Tex and Manson, Manson, um, Tex was one of Manson's followers, had been to that house on a couple of occasions, occasions, and Tex was familiar with the layout. So her and her friends came home from dinner around 1030 at night, and Charles knew that the producer had actually moved out of the home, but he was so set on killing whomever was in it that he sent three uh, women and a man to the house to kill everyone inside. So the murder team arrived at um, Celio Drive just past midnight on August 9th, and Tex Watson climbed a telephone pole near the entrance gate and cut the phone line to the house. And then the murders, the murderers backed their car into the bottom of the hill that led up to the estate and walked back up to the house. Um, they thought the gate might be electrified, so or equipped with an alarm, so they climbed up a bushy embankment and um, ended up going into the yard. So, um, headlights approached them from within um, the angled property, and Tex ordered the women to lie in the bushes and stepped out and ordered the approaching driver to halt, which was where the first victim comes in, um, Stephen Parent. He had been visiting the property's caretaker um, who lived in the guest house. And Tex uh, leveled a 22 caliber at Stephen and frightened the youth and begged him not to hurt him, claiming that he would not say anything. Tex lunged at Stephen with a knife, giving him defensive slash wound on the palm of his hand and severed tendons and tore the boy's watch off of his wrist. And he's only like 18 years old. He just graduated high school. 
Um, but he ended up killing him and shot him four times in the chest. Then they go inside the window, and um, one of the women is named Linda, and she kept watch out by the gate. And they walked over to Stephen's car and waited. Tex removed the screen, entered through the window, and let Susan and Patricia in through the front door. He whispered to Susan and awoke Frykowski, who was sleeping in the living room couch. Tex uh, kicked him in the head, and Frykowski asked him who he was and what he was doing there. And he replied, I am the devil. I am here to do the devil's business. So on Tex's direction, Susan found the house's three other occupants who, um, with Patricia's help, and forced them to leave or forced them into the living room. Tex began to tie Sharon and Jay together by their necks with a rope that he had brought and slung them over the living room ceiling beams. Jay protested the murders rough treatment of pregnant Susan, so Tex shot him. And Abigail was given um, momentarily back to her bedroom for her purse to give him like 70 bucks, and then Jay, st- Jay got stabbed seven times. Like, all these crazy things are happening. So there was another person that was stabbed um, in the front yard, and Frykowski strolled across the lawn, and Tex murdered him with a final uh, stabbing. And he was stabbed over 51 times. He also had been struck 13 times in the head with his gun, with Tex's gun. Um, In the house, Sharon pleaded to be allowed to live long enough to give birth and offered herself as a hostage in an attempt to save her life of her unborn child. But both Susan and Tex stabbed Sharon 16 times, killing her. Um, Manson had told the women to leave a sign, something witchy. So Atkins wrote, pig, on the front door of Sharon. Uh, of the, on the front door with Sharon's blood. Um, he also wrote Helter Skelter with blood as well. That's the Beatles connection. Yes. Um, and then their bodies were later discovered by Sharon's housekeeper early in the morning. So this is where the paranormal stuff comes in. What happened to the baby? Died. Died. Everybody died. Nobody survived. Yes. Everybody died. They ended up burying her with her baby on her chest. Mm. And put her in the grave. It's sad. It just sounds just like mass chaos. Like, yeah. Crazy happening. Yeah. Awful. Yeah. So, which there's some EVPs that are pretty cool that I'll get to later. Um, but so years later, this man named David Omen was building a home only 200 feet away from the now torn down home of Sharon Tate. While building his home, he had some strange things happen to him and the men in his building, or that was building the home. So six months before it was completed, he asked some of the workers if they had been having anything strange happen to them in the house. And one of the workers on the, which they called the third floor, which is actually the basement, said that he heard footsteps coming down the stairs, and they were getting louder and louder, and then they just stopped. A cold breeze then came across his his shoulder, so he ran and took off. Another man was standing near a corner of a room when he heard footsteps in another room, so he went to go check it out. And as he stood there, he heard uh, leather-soled boots walking on the hardwood floors across the room in front of him, and then walk up a couple stairs into the dining room, and then it just disappeared. Then after the house was built, um, David was going to bed, and he was laying his head on a pillow. And... He opened his eyes, and in the middle of the room, he saw an apparition of a man just standing there. And from the waist up, he was turned with his arms stretched out and pointing towards the driveway. And then he was gone. Um, He didn't recognize him at first, but then he went a few months later to the LAPD and did some research on the Manson murders. And he saw a picture of Jay Sebring, which was Sharon Tate's friend, and knew instantly that that's who he saw. So and in the That's crazy yeah, and in the guest bedroom, um, which is in the basement, uh, David's guest Lisa was sleeping and woke up by hearing footsteps in her room, and then she felt someone sit at the edge of her bed. So she hurried and sat up, and she could see the imprint on the bed. Oh my gosh! As someone was sitting there, um, a witness claims to have seen a bleeding pregnant woman walking around outside of the house, which they believe is um, Sharon Tate. 
Okay, that would be absolutely terrifying. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. I don't know what I would do if I was to see something like that. I'd probably just watch, like, uh, <laughs> then hate myself for not taking pictures or everything else. So, um, so ghost hunters actually went out to go investigate, and in the living room, they had they were asking for some concrete evidence. They had already been there for a few hours, and they're like, oh, "I wish we could just have something concrete." And then instantly, a sound goes off in in the kitchen, and um, it sounded like the ice cream maker, like ice cream. Oh my gosh, ice maker! It sounds like when the ice just falls after it's been uh-huh. frozen. And so they went and checked it out, opened the freezer, and there was all this old ice just stuck together. There was no new ice. And then when they talked to the guy afterwards, he was like, oh, my ice maker is broken. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked in a long time. So it wasn't the ice maker. No, they don't know what it was. Um, And in the guest bedroom, they asked for it to make itself known. And the blinds um, in the corner, there are those uh, vertical blinds. And just a section of them on the side just started moving. And they were looking. There was no airflow. There was no air conditioning on, no heat on, no nothing. So th- no windows were open. So they couldn't identify where that was coming from. Um, and then, this is going to be your favorite, Terry. Yes. Using a K2 meter. <laughs> drink. Cheers. Everybody take yes. a drink. <laughs> Using a K2 meter, they were able to get yes or no answers, which I was pretty impressed by because I haven't ever seen like a K2 you meter mean it actually worked work that well. <laughs> so Of course they work. <laughs> I've seen them work, but I've never seen it work this well. So when they were doing yes and no, it was spiking all the way twice for yes and then for no it would spike once and so and it would continue to answer wow i've not seen that this is ghost adventures right no ghost hunters ghost hunters okay um so they're actually you know kind of legit not like ghost adventures no, sorry love you zach <laughs> <laughs> we love you sir every time that they would get an answer they would have cold spots so they would be following followed by cold spots and um the responses that they got were that it was uh jay speaking to them the friend and that sharon tate's spirit was also haunting in the home they asked jay what was if he was able to lower the temperature in the room and he responded with a yes on the k2 so they asked him to lower it from 65 degrees to 62.0 and to be like very specific and he said he could so he did and he actually you could see the temperature go down on the gauge and it, it went to like 62.8 he's like no I want you to go to 62.0 so then it started going down and it stayed to 62.0 you know, I think I've seen this this sounds really familiar yeah yeah so it went to 62.0 and just stayed there for a minute they're like okay that's that's like really cool thanks for doing that and then the temperature just went right back up. So, um, checking their EVPs, they got two very startling female voices. The first one sounded like, and both of these, she it's a female, both of these sound um, desperate. And so she's like, it sounds like, take, 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 and then it just mumbles, and like somebody's coming at you like, no, 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 no. Oh my um, gosh. That's creepy. Yeah. And then um, the next one, it sounds like she's in complete distress and crying out. And it is so sad to hear it. And I, you guys have to watch the episode. I think it's Ghost Hunters um, season three, episode 12 or something like that. Oh, that's got to be heartbreaking to hear it. I'm oh, sure. gosh. Those EVPs, they're, yeah, it's sad. But it, it's definitely female on that. Um, so David ended up creating a movie based on his experiences called The House at the End of the Drive, I think in 2014. Um, but the area itself, interestingly, is a hotbed for activity because um, on that same street, people have been killed. They've committed suicide. Um, there was 
a battle between Native Americans and the early Californians. Um, and so there were Native American bodies found all over that mountaintop. So there's just a lot of, of things that went on in that area. But oddly, um, on the mountaintop, the U.S. Um, Geological Survey call it a geomagnetic anomaly because it ranges anywhere between 5 to 60 times higher than normal. It's that many magnetic pole. That magnetic field is just yeah, so goes. strong. Aliens. <laughs> just <laughs> like, Alien you know, crafted. like when we do our, two, our K2 meet readings and stuff like that, when you're checking for those EMFs. What? You were like doing K two readings, like you don't I do know K2 I don't readings. do I don't do K two readings, <laughs> but I'm just saying it's. But that. I wonder if that's why it worked so well. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Just thought. Okay, yeah. so that's what I was. Thanks, Lisa. So we went from <laughs> some fun movie stuff to some awful, poor, depressing stories from Melissa. I know you're welcome. <laughs> um, and now we'll move uh, to. Washington, D.C. To the world of comedy. Yes. <laughs> the circus. <laughs> or also known as the swamp. Do, 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 do. Um, <laughs> but interesting enough, the White House is probably one of the most haunted buildings um, of all in yeah. in Washington, D.C. It's where I want to investigate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that'd be so fun. <laughs> Me too. Um, and now after like doing this research, I think I agree. I think it would be awesome to be able to do any of this stuff. It just... Or, like, not even really be able to investigate. Like, can we just, like, spend the night? Right. Oh, you know? Please. Just, like, you know, a weekend. Like, it'd be totally fine. It'd be totally cool. Um, but the most uh, prominent guest, um, paranormal guest of the White House is, is none other than Abraham Lincoln. Um, he's the most seen, the most uh, recognized one there. Um, he suffered a lot of loss while he was yeah, there. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did suffer a lot of loss, including his own life. Yep. So, um, for those of you who don't know, um, Abraham Lincoln was the 16th president of the United States. Um, he also uh, he gave the most famous Gettysburg Address uh, that coincided with uh, the Battle of Gettysburg and uh, over the you know over the Civil War. Um, however, it's actually his death that people has, that are captivating uh, people. So on April 14th, 1865, President Lincoln was sitting in a private booth overlooking the stage watching Laura Keene's Our American Cousin when John Wilkes Booth shot him in the back of the head. Bang. Bang. Uh, Although Lincoln didn't die immediately from the wound, he was taken across the street to the boarding house, uh, and on April 15th, 1865, at 7.22 a.m., Lincoln was pronounced dead. Now, many people have since seen Lincoln around Ford's Theater, the White House, and around Washington, D.C. area. And probably the most astonishing thing about Lincoln's death is that it was not much of a surprise to him, to Lincoln himself. After his re-election re- in 1865, he admitted to dreaming of his own death, not in the sense of one dreams of, like, a new house one day, but actually in his sleep. Uh, one of his closest friends wrote down what Lincoln told him one evening in 1865. I soon began to dream. There seemed to be a death-like stillness about me. Then I, he- then I head subdued sobs, as if a number of people were weeping. I thought I left my bed and wandered. Yeah, I thought I left my bed and wandered downstairs. I arrived at the east room. Before me was a cataflex on which rested a corpse wrapped in funeral vestments. Around it were stationed soldiers who were acting as guards, and there was a throng of people, some gazing mournfully upon the corpse, whose face covered, others weeping pitifully. Who was dead in the White House? I, de- I demanded of one of the soldiers. The president was his answer. He was killed by an assassin. And his, Jeez. his dream was only months before his actual assassination. Jeez. So, and then there was another, um, there was another occurrence as well where Lincoln was looking into like a mirror and he saw it was like a double image of himself, one frail and pale and one, you know, normal. And that was a relate to him that he was going to, uh, serve out his first term and then he was going to get reelected. 
that he was going to die um, during his second term. Hmm. So, on to the the fun ghostly sightings. Yes. What we all want to hear. Drake. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. So, Every time Terry says yes, you're supposed to drink. We didn't really specify that before. And we talked about, I don't know, it was at the beginning, it but I don't know if Jess pre- was going to leave it or not. Yep. Well, we don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> but um, there's so many sightings uh, of him that I only took down a handful of them because I think we could there's probably so fill many. a whole episode alone of that. Mm-hmm. So we'll go through some of the more, uh, the more famous ones. Um, Liz Carpenter, who is the press secretary to Lady Bird Johnson... Uh, told author John Alexander that Mrs. Johnson believed she'd felt Lincoln's presence one spring evening while watching a television program about his death. She noticed a plaque she had never seen before hanging over the fireplace. It mentions Lincoln's importance in that room in some way. Mrs. Johnson admitted feeling a strange coldness and decided a sense of unease. Uh, The disquieted apparition has been felt by others. Grace Coolidge, wife of Calvin Coolidge, the 13th president, was the first person to report having actually seen the ghost of Abraham Lincoln. She, she said he stood at the window of the Oval Office, hands clasped behind his back, gazing out over the Potomac, perhaps still seeing the bloody battlefields beyond. The ghost uh, of Abraham Lincoln was seen frequently during the administration of FDR. When the country went through a devastating depression, then a world war, when Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands was a guest at the White House during that period, she was awakened one night by a knock on her bedroom door. Uh, when she opened the door, uh, she saw the bearded president and then fainted. Oh, my gosh. That'd be awesome. <laughs> Down to the ground. Just bang. Gone. <laughs> um, and then in 1940, uh, President... Uh, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, according to accounts, had just stepped out of a hot bath in that same room and was wearing nothing but a cigar when he encountered <laughs> Lincoln by the fireplace. Smirking at him. Yes. Oh my gosh, that's great. <laughs> he said, good evening, Mr. President. You seem to have me at a disadvantage. <laughs> <laughs> Winston was witty. I think that was his nickname, uh, wasn't it? Witty Winston? Winston yeah, I think was so. awesome. No, he was cool. Enough. You know, and it, the thing is, is like, it's so like, it's like so nonchalant. Like, hey, Mr. President. <laughs> That's all. How are you? What, what else are you going to say? <laughs> <laughs> I was in the pool. <laughs> George Costanza defense. Um, visitors to the Peterson House, uh, which is the boarding house where Lincoln uh, died, uh, feel heavy and sad when entering the room where Lincoln uh, died and where his bloodstained sheets are on display. The tall spectral figure has allegedly been spotted at the Capitol, traveling down Pennsylvania Avenue, and even visiting his memorial on the National Mall, which, let's face it, wasn't there when he was alive. Obviously, yeah. (laughs) Um, Adam Seltzer, an author and paranormal historian, calls Lincoln the Johnny Appleseed of ghosts, leaving traces of himself wherever he he traveled in life. There's William H. Mumler, who was a... uh, a renowned uh, early ghost photographer. And he, um, w- there's a super, I guess, I don't want to say famous picture, but there's a, a, you can find it on, you can find it everywhere out on the internet. Uh, it's a picture of Mary Todd Lincoln and what appears to be uh, Abraham sitting or standing over her with his both hands on, his, on her shoulders. Oh, that's cool. Oh. I've seen that photo. Yeah. 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 Hmm. yeah it's really cool. It's interesting. Um, and the neat thing is, is like I've been to Th- Ford's Theater. Um, I actually watched a musical there, which is so cool. So yeah, it was uh, Rent, not so cool. No, oh. um, oh, I like Rent. <laughs> <laughs> we have. How the- do you measure a year, Josh? How do I measure what? A year. Never mind. You didn't That's watch the play. You didn't watch like, the play, did you? I didn't you? really want to be there. <laughs> you didn't pay attention. You know what? <laughs> we were in Washington D.C. There was cats. There was Lion King, and did we go to those? Nope. We went to Rent. Rent is good. I'm sorry, dude. But you went to the <laughs> Ford your Theater. Mouth. But yes, we went to the Fords. We went to Ford. That Theater. would have been the highlight. That was the highlight. That's just why I don't remember the the, the musical at all. Uh, but yet, yeah, they still have uh, his box. Um, 
the presidential box is is still roped off and it's got his picture up there and um and in, in the basement where the bathrooms are they've got artifacts they've got his top hat the clothes that he wore um when i was there they had his bed that he passed away in oh, wow. was down oh, there so cool yeah and i think the the carriage that took him like that was used for his funeral mm -hmm. is is down there or in some vicinity of that uh, that location so it's really cool um and, it's, you know, and it was neat to see all that stuff i bet so that was the highlight it was more more often to be at ford's theater than it was you missed to see out them. it was a good play yeah, I just couldn't. Uh, I just couldn't do it. Just well, a couple other ones that I, I saw when I was looking at the White House stuff. Yeah, just a couple there of uh, ghosts that are commonly seen there said to be there are Abigail Adams, Andrew Jackson, mm -hmm. Dolly Madison, Willie Lincoln, which would be his little boy, his son that passed away in the White House. Yep. yep. Um, that they're thought to be there, and then recently Ronald Reagan was allegedly seen by Barack Obama, and Richard Nixon by Hillary Clinton. Don't believe it. I don't believe it at all. <laughs> Those last two? <laughs> no <way>. <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, I believe it, because I think Reagan was there going, what the hell? He was trying what to are you doing? Like, on tree. <laughs> he was trying to smack him. <laughs> <laughs> trying to throw things at him. And Nixon's like, you thought I was the correct Hillary. <laughs> <laughs> well, did she, didn't, didn't she work for him as, a, as an aide? You know, I don't know. I have no I idea. I thought that's something to that effect yeah. back in the old days. Oh, it's, it's entirely possible. All right, sorry. Tell, tell us about some of, some of the uh, ones that you... Uh, you got it. Drawn. So let's start with uh, Montgomery Clift. So he was a popular film star in the 50s and 60s. Uh, he's also a four-time Oscar-nominated actor, best known for his roles in From Here to Eternity. Now, most of us here have heard of that. Elisa, have you heard of From Here to Eternity? She's a baby. Yeah, I've never that's heard why of I'm it. asking. I've never heard not. of it either, and I'm the oldest one here. So I've, okay. I've heard of it, and I don't think I've ever seen it. Yeah. Well, they got like that famous, you know, on the beach scene. And okay. Anyways, no, Google it. That's Chariots of Fire. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, we're quickly learning that you don't watch a lot of movies. I don't. No. He's like, ain't nobody got time for that. We're going to have to educate you a little bit. Anyways. We need to start building a list. <laughs> A long list. A I long think. list. Well, yeah. What we'll do is we'll build a list of all the movies I've seen, and then we can subtract that from all the movies made of all time, and then we've got what I got to watch. Oh my goodness! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So um, he also did uh, a movie known as A Place in the Sun. So it's reported that his spirit um, is seen at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel, um, and specifically in room nine twenty eight. So that's the room where uh, he had spent like three months in 1953 where he was memorizing his lines for the motion picture from here to eternity. So he would pace back and forth with his script, trying to memorize his lines. He'd take his phone off the hook so that he wasn't disturbed up in his room. So some of the things that are reportedly happening um, are there's loud, explain, on, loud unexplained noises are often heard coming from the empty suite they find the phone off the hook, um, like when he was alive. Um, cold spots are felt uh, throughout the suite and the hallways, and guests often report a presence um, that is on scene, but they can feel it. And then I think this is the one. Well, let me turn my page here. Um, so, and then one lucky guest, and I would have loved this. I mean, it'd be a little kind of catch you off guard, but she was the only one in that room and she felt an unseen hand patting her on the shoulder, like comforting oh, cool. her. Yeah. So, and that's all I have for her. Where are we going on vacation next? <laughs> right? I have a list. I think we're, <laughs> I think we're going to go to some hotels. In, Holly's in Holly's Holly's hotels? Go, absolutely. Make sure we get the right room numbers. Right? Have fun. I want to go to Vegas. Just kidding. Well, you know, like <laughs> Vegas, like, Vegas kind, is kinda. on the way to Hollywood. Yeah, we'll just drop you point. off. Oh, <laughs> 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 yeah, we'll drop you off. We'll pick you up on the way back. <laughs> I'm sure there's hundred rooms in Vegas we can find. Oh, oh I'm sure there is yes. plenty. That's a yeah. sad, sad city. Yes. Okay, so moving on, we got James Dean. Obviously, he was a film Yum. star of the 1950s. Yeah, right. Yum. Yummy. Yum. No, you're, th you're, think you're thinking of Jimmy Dean, the sausage oh, king. No. <laughs> That's no. yummy, too. Not Jimmy <laughs> Dean. James Dean. James Dean. So he was a film star of the early 1950s. Um, he was known to live a life in the fast lane. So, you know, kind of reckless, young, fresh-faced Hollywood kid. 
Um, he purchased a Porsche Spider um, with the intent oh, for racing it. Um, and he take a drink. <laughs> he lovingly called it Little Bastard. Um, so, but just weeks after uh, the purchase of his car, he was actually killed in a head-on collision, and that happened September 30th of 1955. Anyways, afterwards, anyone that would come in contact with the car itself or any of the parts from the car would seem to suffer injuries and, and often death. The until car is cursed. It is cursed. It is said to be cursed. And then after, um, I don't know how long, but the car mysteriously disappeared. So in reference to this, for anybody that kind of just wants to go and, and check it out, you can watch uh, Supernatural Season 5, Episode 5, and it's called Fallen Idols. And they reference uh, the car in there. So. And that was a silent yes for all of you at home. <laughs> yeah, because I'm score. seeing people drinking here. So. Okay. I'm very silent. I'm shaking. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Supernatural. Okay. So then we move on to Clark Gable, uh, known as one of the biggest box office stars during the 1930s and 40s. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was a great timing. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that? Oh, that's Callie. Okay. Um, so he said to haunt the Oatman Hotel in Oatman, Arizona, along with his wife, Carol Lombard. Uh, so this is where they had originally spent their honeymoon after being married in a nearby town of Kingman, Arizona, which is also known as the gateway to Hoover Dam. So then, obviously, his wife, Carol Lombard, she was a uh, top... Uh, comedy actress of the 1930s. <clears throat> Excuse me. She was married, obviously, she married Clark Gable in 1939. Uh, she was killed in a plane crash just three years after being married. She's been seen at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. That was me. <laughs> Dang. Okay. <laughs> She's seen at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel near the suite that she shared with her husband, Clark Gable, and of course at the Omen Hotel where they honeymooned. Getting a one destination nailed down for a hotel. Yes, right here. Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel, because there are multiple. Let's go. So um, you can reference kind of Carol Lombard's death and haunting if you watch, and here we go again, running theme, the season eight <laughs> premiere of Ghost Adventures. Um, and it, the title is called uh, Pioneer Saloon, and it's one of the oldest saloons in the country, and it's in the town of Good Springs, Nevada. So we're going to have to get some royalties off of this. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> we're plugging it all, right? Um, and then I'm... There's Marilyn Monroe. I didn't really write a lot on this. Um, what I had was so short. Basically, she was found dead in her room. It was believed to be an overdose of sleeping pills. Um, she, she actually was found in a coma. Yeah. And then, they, um, and then the next day, she passed away. Um, so she never came out of her coma. And then they say like, she's seen at the Hollywood Roosevelt hotel. Um, there was a mirror that was in her suite, which was next to a pool, you know, kind of by the pool there. And it's now down, I think in the, like the lobby or something, they move that mirror. It's no longer in that room. And it said that they can see her reflection in it, that she's been seen. Yeah, I think they had it in like the manager's office somewhere. Yeah. 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 Um, and they've had psychics that have gone there and have claimed to communicate with Marilyn Monroe and state that Marilyn's very adamant about, I didn't commit suicide. It was an accident. Oh, she was murdered. That's my thought. And oh, that's what yeah. I think. I think she was murdered. Conspiracy theory. Because she wasn't she supposed to have like a press conference the next day? I think so. And I think the Kennedys were scared that she was going to spill all the beans and, you yeah. know. And then mysteriously, she's overdosed on sleeping pills. So I believe she was murdered as well. Okay, so my last one. Rudolph Valentino. How many have heard of him? Nope. No, Josh? Uh, Honestly, besides me doing this today, have you heard of him? Oh, no. Mike has? Old guy has. Old guy yeah, has? Yeah, I, I, I got you. Yeah. Okay, so Rudolph Valentino was known as uh, one of the greatest romantic leading men of Hollywood's silent movie era. Um, on, yeah, yeah, I, I, I like this guy. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, his career was cut short. Uh, he ended up dying from complications from an ulcer at the age of just 31. Yeah, um, he was young. Sad, yeah. So he's also known as the Latin lover. 
Um, it said that Valentino haunts the home, his home in Hollywood, and and he's actually known as being the most active uh, ghost there. So he's he's made lots of appearances. Um, he's been spotted in a number of places, most often um, his former mansion, which he used to call the Falcon's Lair. Um, they see him in the hallways. They see him in his old bedroom. Uh, they've actually seen him peering out of a second story window and in the stables. Wow. Um, so That's it said, a lot. That's it's a lot, a lot right? A lot. Well, and it's not over yet. So, but there was a stable hand that after Valentino had died, he went into the stable where he, when he looked down, um, like the corridor of the stables, he saw Valentino standing there petting his favorite horse. Oh, really? And That's so the, cool. the stable hand, knowing that Valentino had died, freaked out, left and refused to come back. He's like, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he's also been seen at his beach house in um, Oxnard. So he's a traveler. He's a traveler. And the Santa, um, the Santa Maria Inn in Santa Maria, where he's known to knock on the doors and he will recline on the bed. He's romantic even after he dies. Wow. <laughs> he's like, hey, baby. Hey, yeah. <laughs> um, he's also How's bliss- it going? How are <laughs> <Right>? you doing? <laughs> uh, Valentino has also been seen uh, flowing around the costume department or the Paramount Studios and roaming the catwalks above Studio 5. So lastly, Valentino has been sighted near his final resting place, which is at the Cathedral Mausoleum at Hollywood's Forever Memorial Park. And so this actually, um, what I'm going to read lastly, uh, came from his diary. And I found this, I found this interesting. So I wanted to end with this. Yeah, this is really cool. So Valentino's diary, he wrote, what the average man calls death I believe to be merely the beginning of life itself. We simply live beyond the shell. We emerge from, we emerge out of this narrow, um, out of its narrow confines like chrysalis. Why call it death? Or if we give it the name death, why surround it with dark fears and sick imaginings? I am not afraid of the unknown. Cool. Maybe that's why he shows up everywhere. Right? Yeah. He's Easy. accepted. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. He's our people. Darn tootin'. So. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me. Cool note is that uh, that hotel. Yeah. Um, you can actually rent out uh, the Gable uh, penthouse. Yeah. So oh, let's do it. It's on the list. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I had it's, a list. It's 3,200 square feet. That's as big as my house. That's right? bigger than this place. <laughs> yeah, but it's, wow. it's bigger than my house. It's, it's, the, it's the Gable and Lombard Suite. It's where they live. Oh. So they lived on so the, the top tower of, of that hotel. Yeah, oh, that's cool. They were considered to be like the ideal Hollywood couple. They had such a great marriage and connection, I guess, in their short mm-hmm. Very short. three years of marriage. Yeah. yeah. Tragic in itself. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Mike, take us to Prentice Day present. All right. Day. So we're going to jump around the uh, the present times. These are all probably people that you've heard of. <laughs> <laughs> no offense or anything. I, I've heard of I've heard of most of those. In fact, I've heard of all of those because um, I'm old. But uh, so in no particular order, and uh, we'll try to just to get through these kind of fun and and uh, and quickly. But uh, first up, Anna Nicole Smith. Anybody ever heard of her? Lovely, yep, lovely check. lady. She was a Marilyn Monroe wannabe. She was a former yeah. uh, playmate um, in Playboy. Uh, she claimed to actually have a sexual encounter with a ghost who would often climb up her leg in her sleep. Wow. She said she enjoyed sure the... Sure inter- it wasn't her cat? <laughs> yes. She said she enjoyed the interaction, stating, I was freaked out about it, but then I was like, well, you know what? He's never hurt me, and he just gave me some amazing sex, so no problem. Whoa. That's quotes. I can totally unquote. hear her say that so, too. She's she must know Amethyst Realm then. Perhaps <laughs> she might. <laughs> um, but she uh, she did uh, overdose um, she, on uh, February eighth of two thousand seven, and her spirit is said to haunt room six oh seven at the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino, where she was found dead. Uh, the rooms have since been renumbered to deter paranormally motivated visitors like us. Her ghost does. Uh, we'll is, find it. Her ghost is often seen wandering the halls, though, and so you can still go check in the hotel and uh, maybe, maybe you'll get lucky. 
I'll admit it. I watched her her trashy reality show. <laughs> I, I, oh, that's right. She had one, didn't she? She did. It was called Anna Nicole Smith Show. I and I watched every I, single episode. I don't remember watching some I of that. I don't even again. remember that. I don't. I barely I, remember that. I don't waste your time. <laughs> <laughs> I could say don't waste your time on any of those reality TV shows. <laughs> Shush. <laughs> but Supernatural is so good. <laughs> You're calling that that's, a reality that's, TV that's, show? That's <laughs> That's a documentary, not a, not a reality. <laughs> Next thing you know, you're going to be calling Ghost Adventures reality. <laughs> Pseudo reality. <laughs> right. Um, so next on the list, Brittany Murphy. Uh, mm, Brittany Murphy. I loved her. I so her. actually, the, I couldn't find a lot of information on Brittany Murphy's uh, sightings. However, her her home is a stop on the haunted Hollywood tours, and it's uh, rumored that she has seen. At that estate, so that's why, that's why they would go there. It is. So sad. Well, most of them are sad, but you know, Hollywood's that tragic, like burn too bright and get snuffed out way well, too they, quick. They, they use yeah. you and abuse you, and so you go there and you, yeah, you you yeah. burn bright and then you are discarded and and they don't seem to care what they do to you. No, you know? it's, a, it's a city of broken if, dreams. If you go there, expect hearts. to get addicted to drugs and then get crapped on. Well, didn't her husband die mm-hmm. later of the same mysterious whatever? I Did you read that part? Where, nope. No. Wow. Yeah. Well, I watched a documentary on it, and they were saying, they were thinking that he was the one that caused her death. Right. But then he died of the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. All right. Next one. We got two celebrities in the same story here. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. So, uh, actor and comedian Dan Aykroyd, okay, we all know him. Never Dan heard Aykroyd, of him. Uh, one of the <laughs> one of the Ghostbusters. Actually, a very uh, a much of a paranormal enthusiast. Absolutely is. Um, yep. So he lives in Los Angeles, and he lives in a home that was once owned by Cass Elliot of the Mamas and the Papas. Aykroyd claims that Elliot's ghost has snuggled up with him in bed, turned on his stairmaster, and messes around in a jewelry box. So, I've wow. also seen other ones where he, other quotes where he has received other beneficial pleasures from Mama Cass. <laughs> oh, so, so kind of we'll like in the second Ghostbusters, just where just like in the Ghostbusters, oh, um, where yeah. so was things the, were was, done to him. That's why they put that in that I was movie. Saying, was the scene put in because of that? I would wager yes. Did that happen? Because it was written by wow. Dan Aykroyd and, <laughs> and Harold Ramis. Yeah. Wow! 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 So, so oh but the, like it turned. So she turned on his stairmaster, like turned on and used it, or turned on and said, "Get she your butt on was, there." Well, she was a big girl, and so maybe I don't know. Maybe she just told him to get his lazy butt up and get on that. Maybe stairmaster. she's saying, "Don't follow my fate." Yeah. Um, I don't remember exactly how she died. According she, to Austin Powers, it was a ham sandwich. I, say she, I thought she died. On, like she choked, right? She choked, yeah, yeah. eating the ham sandwich. <laughs> That's what they say, but her daughter says that is not. Well, Austin Powers is not going to lie. <laughs> He's the international man of mystery. Yes. Well, it must be true then. It must be true. <laughs> Jeez. All right. We got lots of friends here. Corey Monteith. Anybody know who Corey Monteith is? Yes. No. Have you ever seen the TV show Glee? Yes. Yes. Nope. Yeah, he was. Uh, what oh, was. His was name? Was he the the he was the main, the main he was boy? Finn. He was Finn. 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 Yeah. yeah, he was Finn. Mm-hmm. So uh, employees at the Vancouver Vancouver Hotel where he uh, where he passed away claims to have seen his ghost in the elevator numerous times. Apparently, oh, he wow. still, still hangs out there. That just happened not so, too long ago. So. Yeah, yeah. just yeah. Like a few years ago. Yeah, that's ago. really sad. Um, next up, this is a bigger one. Elvis Presley, woo, the king. I haven't heard of him uh-huh. either. Thank you. Who's that? Thank you very much. Whoa. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> Did you just hear DDP? Hmm. I guess I just heard I heard just heard I'll just say thank you. That very was much. you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so according to the Houston Press, uh, Elvis Presley's ghost has been reported all over the place. And the, all the things that I read, it comes out to be kind of true. Everybody who claims to have seen Elvis. And uh, unfor- <laughs> un, uh, coincidentally, most of them t- tend to happen around Vegas. <laughs> so I think they're impersonators that people are seeing. It was like, look, it's Elvis. It's like, no, it's. So, what if it's like somebody, like an impersonator that passed away that you're seeing? As yeah, a it's like. <laughs> well, yeah, there's like, that possibility too, I right? I know that yeah. ghosts are busy, but. But have, go ahead. I have an interesting connection with Elvis. Okay. Do so, tell. 
when Elvis joined the military, right? Yes. He had to sit down in a barber chair and get his head shaved. Oh, that's right. I heard this story. I have sat in and had my hair cut in the same chair that Elvis had his done in. It's in Fort Chaffee, Arkansas. Wow. So when you got your hair done and you were done, did you go, thank you. Thank you very much. Did you curl your lip? (laughs) Uh I did not. (laughs) All right. So... um, it makes a lot of sense that he's actually seen all over the, the place because he's one of the biggest stars in modern history, possibly one of the biggest stars even ever. Um, unsurprisingly, the majority of the encounters take place at Graceland in Memphis, uh, Tennessee, where he lived until his death at the age of a whopping 42. I am older than, than he was. I always think of like, you know, you think of like the big old jumpsuit, fat Elvis, you know. He, I'm, yeah, I thought he was like 56. No, he was, he was young. Uh, he died of a heart attack in the bathroom of his Graceland home on August 16th of 77. Just a, almost, I was almost one year from, uh, to my birthday. Uh, so I was one years old. Uh, many, of the reports, uh, many of the reports share the claim of feeling a buzz or a vibe in his kitchen. Whatever that vibe means. But they feel a buzz. There's an energy there in his kitchen. Um, and he was famous for eating. So that would make a little bit of sense. Uh, numerous videos have surfaced on YouTube over the years alleging that these uh, these videos are showing that there's like a little figure that leaks out, looks out the windows and the curtains move and it's all supposed to be Elvis. So, How cool would it be to be able to get into Graceland faked. to investigate? Oh, no, it would never happen. That would be no, no, never it happen, would never happen, but it would be... Never happen. It would be amazing. It would be But you don't have to get amazing. into to Graceland to... Uh, to see him. I mean, heck, let's just go to Vegas. But um, he did have a uh, recording studio in his basement there, right? And so, uh, you ever see the show Boardwalk Empire? No. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've heard of it. Yeah, me neither. But there was an actress <laughs> named Paz de la Huerta, and she had sexual ectoplasmic touching experience with Elvis. Ooh. <laughs> and Lisa's over here just shaking her in, head going, in, the re- in that recording studio? In the recording studio in, 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 in at Graceland. So... Interesting. Do they do they rent that out to record? Whoa. I don't think so anymore. <laughs> well, no, no, no. I was Why, just thinking, do like... Do you have a song you want to go record? And no, <laughs> like, we could do a podcast in there. That'd be so cool. I'm not interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> you want some, Skip. you know, ectoplasm? Yeah, pass. I don't want ecto uh, action. So, uh, she said... <laughs> so, sexual ectoplasmic touching experience. Uh, she says, I went to Elvis's recording studio. It becomes sometimes... The sensitive people feel him in this room, and I stood in this corner, and I felt him. And what can I say? I felt him touch me. I mean, come on, he's a ghost. It was like Elvis was tickling me with a feather. (laughs) I I felt his spirit go through me, she recalled, and it gave me pleasure. (laughs) Whoa. Whoa. Okay. She must have been desperate. <laughs> you know, some people will just take it where they Easy, get it. Easy, desperate, whatever. <laughs> yeah. No touching. No touchy. <laughs> this no is touchy. my safety square. Do not touch me there. <laughs> this is my no, no square. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so the king is also speculated to haunt the Las Vegas Hilton, the site of his final, final performance in 1976. Uh, there he's been spotted in his penthouse suite. Uh, the basement where he hung out before and after the show, and the freight elevator that he used to hide from his droves of fans. Uh, during one of his performances, uh, singer Wayne Newton witnessed Elvis's ghost looking down at him while he sang. Uh, there may have been... And so that's where I'm like... Because they saw him like in the crowd, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you sure it wasn't an impersonator? Right. Because there's so many Elvises in Vegas. Maybe it was one of the flying Elvises. Maybe. All right. Um, I've, I've never seen a vet Provo, you Elvis in Vegas. You've Haven't never? you? No. God, I've seen like fifty of them. Oh yeah. <laughs> you don't go to Vegas enough, sir. Well, I just drive down the strip. You can go. Then you can get out and go take your picture. I went. I went during the but day. I was like, there. I was like up and around mostly during the day, and then at night I was asleep. I was like the opposite of you're like doing how Vegas, you're wrong, to do Vegas wrong, bro. Wrong. I know, but I was at conferences, and like, uh, they, they happen during the day. Work hard, play hard. Come on. <laughs> okay. You can cool. survive on four hours of sleep, Josh. <laughs> it is possible. It is, if you drink a lot of caffeine. <laughs> so there have been a number of sightings of Elvis driving around on the Vegas Strip. So he's driving around. <laughs> <laughs> he's talented. In his Cadillac? In, uh, 
Well, yeah, actually, yes. <laughs> 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 the, report, the, re, the reports are often discarded, seeing that there are a number of Elvis impersonators and red Cadillacs in the area. So, yeah, he was like summoned a Ford Focus, and <laughs> <laughs> he, had a, he had a Dodge minivan. It was great. And he had an Indian accent. <laughs> it, was, it was Indian Elvis. Um, the uh, film star, as well as a rock legend, Elvis Presley was known to haunt Hollywood's Knickerbocker Hotel, where he regularly um, stayed. In room 1016, uh, it seems to be the upper t- epicenter of the activity there, as guests uh, describe that, that room as being unreasonably chilly. Um, it's probably just good air conditioning. Who knows? Um, he could be there. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's, he's got lots of places to go. He's got to go to Graceland. He's got to go to Vegas. He's got, you know. He's a happening man. He's, a he's happening on tour. Uh, the RCA recording studio in Nashville, where he recorded Heartbreak Hotel, has had a number of paranormal occurrences as well. Um, now used as a television production studio, Stagehands claim that the mention of his name, just mentioning his name, is enough to summon the king's ghost. So, like, Elvis. <laughs> he's not here. <laughs> Okay, so maybe we should record there and then summon him. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. We, could, we could probably rent that place out for a couple dollars. See what EVPs we get there in the middle of the podcast. Right. <laughs> um, but they can sum, But just mentioning his name will summon the king's ghost. Uh, lights have been known to blow out. Ladders fall over on their own. Mysterious noises have been heard. Uh, Ellis has also been seen wandering around Nashville. <laughs> Again, probably. And he gets around. Similarly he does. to the Vegas sightings, they're often He's discredited due to investigate due to impersonators. Uh, there is um, this was an interesting story. So there's a, a book called Elvis Afterlife: Unusual Psychic Experiences Surrounding the Death of a Superstar. That's a long freaking title. Um, by Short a book, a Dr. Raymond <laughs> A. Moody Jr. Anyway, uh, he details the story of a Georgia police officer named Harold, Harold Welch. And one of Welch's four sons, Tony, had taken $2,000 and run away from home to pursue a career in acting in Las Vegas. Tony left behind a room filled with posters and records of his idol, Elvis Presley. So one night, the king uh-huh, appears to Tony's father as a, pol- as a police officer, having famously collected police badges. And Elvis did. He collected... Tons of police badges. Well, he didn't he become a police officer by going up to the White House and saying, I want to be a police officer? And they're like, okay. I don't know. Uh, that's Steven Seagal, maybe. No. no I know sure Steven Seagal, be, probably. <laughs> pretty Steven sure it was Seagal Elvis. became a cop. Legit, too. Um, so anyway, he appears to, to Tony's father, who's a police officer, and he appears as a police officer. And uh, Elvis told the rather worried officer, Welch, that he, too, was concerned but that he was unable to personally help the boy. However, he knew that Tony was with a bad crowd and on drugs, and he was able to provide a description of the surrounding area where Tony was staying in L.A. Officer Welch and his family rented a car and drove to California in hopes of finding his missing son. Shockingly, they located him in a rundown house near the exact scene that Elvis, his spirit, had described. Um, Officer Welch elected not to share his source for knowing where the missing boy was, fearing he'd be laughed at, and... Probably rightly so. Maybe. Uh, After a tear-filled reunion, Tony later revealed to his father that he had dreamed that Elvis had told him that his father was coming to get him. The ghost of Elvis is particularly well-traveled, and uh, his wife, ex-wife Priscilla actually claims to speak to him on a regular basis. Wow. So if it was the real ghost of Elvis, then, yeah, he's Mr. Good Deeds, too. That's kind of a fantastical He's Officer Good Deeds. It is kind of fantastical. Which makes me kind of question it, right? Yeah, I mean, like, it, there's that story that it's like too cool to be true, but almost. not impossible. No, it's it's interesting. I mean, like, there's some validity to it. If sure, like, even if it wasn't, let's say it wasn't Elvis, but it was somebody else. The fact of the matter is, is that someone came to him and said, "Hey, your kid's over here at this location," and then you find your kid in that spot. Mm-hmm. Like that's. The story in itself is cool. It is a very yeah. cool story, and I hope it's true. Um, but, uh, yeah. So that's Elvis. Uh, next up, Farrah Fawcett. Anybody know Farrah Fawcett? Yes. Charlie's yes. Angels fan? Yes. Okay, so a year following the death of Farrah Fawcett, actress and former neighbor, Tori Spelling. <laughs> Everybody remember her? Mm-hmm. Beverly Hills, mm-hmm. Okay. No, I've seen her reality show. She, <laughs> yeah, I don't good, watch her reality show. 
Uh, she conducted a seance with uh, U.S. television medium John Edwards. I've not heard of him, but he has a series called Crossing Over. I, I have his book. Okay. Yeah. Um, she's certain that she made contact with uh, with Farrah Fawcett, the, the Charlie's Angels icon. And Spelling stated, quote, it was pretty surreal. I can't talk like a valley girl, but uh, it was pretty surreal. So like it was like really like totally surreal. <laughs> we were neighbors for years. She basically wanted me to give a message to her son, Redmond, and to enter her family. And she was doing these very specific call outs for things that they would not totally understand. <laughs> yeah. You're not saying the word like enough. No, I'm reading the quote. Uh, he offered to do a reading with me, and I was hoping that he w- I would talk to my dad, because um, I'd lost a best friend a long time ago, and I was hoping that he would come through. And then all of a sudden he said, Farrah Fawcett's coming through. <laughs> it's probably nothing like Tori Spelling, but I don't care. I think John Edwards is the first person, the first medium that you introduced me to. Like, not in person, but like, we watched a show of it. Yeah, he did have a show. My stepmom and I think a couple of my sisters went to one of his readings shortly after my brother Will passed. And, yeah, they they just marvel it. They were too chicken to stand up, but they believed that Will was coming through, and they were just too chicken to stand up. Mm-hmm. I get that. I well, she, she says he's legit. It actually says that in the quote. She quotes <laughs> him. Quoting her more. <laughs> so, first of all, skeptics who pointed out, you know, it seems like a bit of publicity stunt for her show. She had a show called Territory. Um, but she assured people that it's legit commenting <laughs> that <laughs> if it had been some psychic that had walked in off the street for five bucks, it would have been different, she said. Because you paid $10,000 for it. But it it's came, legit now. But it, came through, <laughs> but it came through John Edward. He's a medium. So he channels, <laughs> so he channels people. I've been to regular psychics that turn over cards, tarot cards, and sort of read your future, that type of thing. But with him, literally, people just come to him and say things that they want the person to hear. End quote. There you go. So that's quoted. <laughs> oh, wait. There's actually a little bit more. So then she stared her story with Ryan O'Neill uh, on, from the Today Show. And I guess he's on the Today Show. And that was her former uh, partner. And she said that uh, she actually had written a letter to her partner, actor Ryan O'Neill, and explained to him that the letter and everything that happened and said that none of this makes sense. Please don't think I'm crazy. This literally happened. I'm just passing on the information, but it was pretty bizarre at the time. <laughs> and did she get so, on the Today Show from that, too? It sounded like she did. Oh, probably. I don't know. It's like it's a great way to just go out and get yourself some publicity. I had a lot of fun quoting all that because there was so much quote. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, it's so cool. Like, he just so came to me. If, if you want to talk to Farrah Fawcett, go visit Tori Spelling's house. <laughs> okay, uh, next up, uh, Joan Crawford. Did anybody know Joan Crawford? Yes. Oh, no wire hangers. Wire hangers. No, it, there is oh, a, yeah. Okay, so here's what's crazy about this. This is like legit her. I was totally scared of her as a child. Yeah, because of my well, dearest. good reason, because her daughter says that was legit. That was mm-hmm. her life. So Hollywood legend Joan Crawford's home in Brentwood, California, is haunted by malevolent spirits, according to her doctor, adopted daughter and mommy dearest author, Christina. So that movie was written by her daughter. Wow. Okay. So this is what's crazy about it. Her daughter wrote the story about her mom, and her mom acted in it. Oh my gosh. Crazy. It's kind of messed up. Right? Do you, do you think she realized it was her? I don't think she cared. I don't think she cared. Um, so that... <laughs> So whenever Christina spoke about the strange happenings to her mother, the things that were going on in the house, Joan would actually punish her for it. Um, The house was sold years later, and the new owners also experienced unexplained fires through the house. And the sounds... Again with these fires. and fires. And the sounds of children crying inside the walls, leading them to have the place exercised on a number of occasions. Uh, Christina, her, uh, her daughter, adopted daughter, went on to say that every single owner of the house has had trouble. The first one was Crawford. She built the majority of the house. It was a small cottage when she bought it. But most of the house uh, she built. Every single family that's lived in that house has had horrible things happen. Uh, Illnesses, alcoholism, addictions, uh, relationship problems. And now, evidently, with the current owner, the walls are actually breaking out in flames. Um, I've heard that in particular in the wall, it's behind Crawford's bed is where it has the biggest problems. Now, to me, I think of that as like, well, maybe it's got really bad wiring. 
<laughs> right? Yeah. And so that would cause problems for With fires. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But who knows? I'm I'm not above accepting things if that's ruled out. Um, though ghost hunters, house healers, and exorcists who have uh, visited the estate over the years claim not to sense Joan Crawford's presence, many do still believe the house was built on an already haunted land, and the evil that with, was within it drove Joan to be cruel to her children. Uh, Christina said that she would not be surprised if the ghost of her mother is also causing trouble in the house, as she was capable of real evil. If reports are correct, then Crawford simply just joined the already ongoing ghost party at her home. It was claimed that Crawford and the other ghosts would try to light fires and burn the house down. An exorcist was hired to get rid of the ghosts. Um, and that exorcist said it had a real negativity to it. A real astral central. Whatever astral central means. It's interesting it's a though. portal. You said a lot of ghosts. Or a lot of exorcisms. Yeah. Like a lot of exorcisms in the house. So, did they not do it right? Like... Mm -hmm. It, it it comes to the question like is it is it something that's not the building itself is it people that are there or is there there's more to it I think there's more to it personally I think there's a lot of negative stuff there and sometimes it doesn't just go away I mean we've all been mm -hmm. on uh, you know residential investigations where we'll cleanse a house and it's just a temporary band aid um, but things can still come back yeah unless the homeowners change thing you know change what's going on there. Yeah, and, and we've seen it many times. And this is Hollywood again, right? There ain't nothing good going on in Hollywood. No. Well, that's what I'm saying. Is if this house is yeah. in Hollywood, like yeah. you're talking about a, a place of addiction and abuse and all sorts of other negative things that are going it's, on there, it's just going to breed it. It's mm -hmm. in Brentwood. I'm not 100% sure where Brentwood is, but I imagine I it's... I think that's a suburb of, suburb of, of Hollywood. LA. LA, yeah. Uh, next up, uh, this one was kind of fun. John Belushi. Funny guy in life, funny guy in death, right? Uh, the Saturday Night Live star and uh, one of the Blues Brothers, uh, John Belushi died in, a, in Bungalow 3 at uh, Chateau Marmont, and that's a hotel in L.A., after a drug and alcohol overdose in 82, and he had been binging on drink and drugs. Um, anyway, today, today, guests that are in this Bungalow 3 have experienced feeling of being watched, especially when they're looking in the bathroom mirror. In 1999... Something looking at me. <laughs> well, that's when you feel the most vulnerable, though, right? Makes sense. Yeah, it's also when you're looking at yourself. Yeah. <laughs> well, in 1999, a family on vacation noticed that their toddler was talking to and laughing at no one while in the hotel room. Oh, my gosh. Um, according to the Travel Channel, when they, asked him, when they asked him why, he would say, The funny man. So on the way out of the hotel, the boy pointed to a picture of John Belushi, because he stayed there a lot. And he goes, the funny man. Oh, and, that's awesome. That and is so, so cool. it's suspected that John uh, Belushi was there in the room entertaining the little kid. <laughs> I think of like Bluto, right? In the uh, Animal House. He's like doing like, I don't know. He's oh, like, yeah. He's, when he puts mashed potatoes in his mouth. Yeah. And he goes, <laughs> zip. Just trying to do yeah. funny things just to make the kid laugh. Um, he would be an interesting ghost to come, come around to. Absolutely. Yeah, one. Uh, John Wayne. You ever heard of that guy? John Wayne once owned a yacht named the Wild Goose. You said no, John. <laughs> Smack you. Uh, once owned a yacht named the Wild Goose. Its successful owners have all reported sightings of the actor aboard the ship. According to the LA Times, a psychic who was brought on board came to the conclusion that John wasn't there for malevolent reasons. He just really liked his boat. So he hangs out there whenever he can. He's uh, spotted in the mirrors. He's spotted in the portholes. Portholes? Portals? Portals? <laughs> portholes. <laughs> And he's been known to not to uh, block doorways and rattle beer glasses. To not block doorways? No, he blocks. Oh. He block, known to block doorways. And he rattles the glasses because he wants a beer. Yeah. Or a shot of whiskey. It's drinking Whatever. time. Whatever. Take so your he pick. put the beer bottles on his fingers and Drink. Like, warriors, <laughs> yeah, warriors come, come out, out and play. <laughs> That's from an old movie called The Warriors again. <laughs> Check it out. Uh, Judy Garland, one of the many ghosts thought to be residents uh, or visitors of New York City's Palace Theater. Garland might be one of the most well-known. Um, her spectral form has supposedly been sensed hanging around at the doors uh, that she used when she was performing at the, the, at the theater in the 50s. Um, Liberace. We're going to come back to one of my bigger ones here. Uh, Liberace. Terry loves Liberace. She actually, I've, I've played on one of his pianos before. Yeah. Liberace, uh, he was born in Wisconsin. He's a pianist, a singer, 
Uh, I'm not going to say his name because I can't say his name. He's a big performer in Las Vegas. Yes. So we'll just call him Liberace. Mm -hmm. Um, He was the highest paid entertainer in the world from the 1950s to the 70s and was renowned for his flamboyant showmanship. Uh, Google him. You got to go home, Elisa. No, it's recording you right now. (laughs) Say everything you have to say. I like, keeps looking at her watch. I'm like, you got to go somewhere because I'm your ride. I just got a buzzer and all of a sudden yeah. it just started recording. Just decided so he was, to start recording you. Liberace wants to be heard. <laughs> so he was uh, renowned for his flamboyant showmanship. Um, and in February 4th, 1987, the legendary performer died from pneumonia as a complication of AIDS. Uh, many sightings of Liberace's ghost have taken place along the Vegas Strip, which, again, <laughs> impersonators. In Vegas. Right. In Vegas. And he's also said to haunt his mansion. Another thing in Vegas is, you, you know, I notice a lot of people are walking around with open containers. Right? They're drunk. A lot of people are drunk. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I'm sure it was the real Liberace. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure it was. Um, uh, they actually made a film about him um, for HBO called Behind the Candelabra. Candelabra mm-hmm. And Michael Douglas portrayed him. Very interesting show to watch, but he was saying that when he was playing the piano and portraying Liberace, he would feel hands come and press on his shoulders while he was playing the piano wow. and was uh, being Liberace. That's, That's really cool. cool. I wonder if those hands were like the fingers were moving like a puppet. Like telling him where to put his fingers like Ratatouille. It's like Ratatouille. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be cool. It was well, really Liberace. Only that was that his hair. The way that he would do his little piano boogie was really interesting. It was really cool. If you've never seen that, go check it out. The, what does he call it? The piano boogie? I think it's piano boogie, boogie. I don't know. You can actually see it where they'll do a side by side of him performing it as you know Liberace, and then Michael Douglas copycatting it, and it's almost like frame for frame perfect. It's crazy it's piano. It's crazy. It's crazy talent. Dang. All right, everybody's heard of this guy, the magical, wonderful, magical mystery tour man, John Lennon. Right. Yep. So we actually mentioned him a little bit earlier. Josh, you've never heard of him either? Man, Josh is... is I, uh, look, I'm going to start calling you Patrick. I lived in and a... And he lives in, under a rock. I, yeah, I lived That's in a rock. That's what I was going to say. It was in North Dakota. <laughs> like, I lived in a rock in North Dakota. Are you in anything. Amish country? <laughs> 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 no, it, it would it would have been a Hooterite country. Okay. All right, so... Um, John Lennon, obviously one of the Beatles. Uh, since his tragic assassina- assassination on uh, December 8th of 1980... Who here was born in 19... It was alive in 1980. All of you but me. Not Elisa. (laughs) There have been more and more reports of people claiming to have seen or at least sensed the ghost of the former Beatles member, John Lennon. Uh, Most sightings occur in and around the Dakota in New York. So this is the place that uh, Terry and... Rosemary's Baby. And um, Elisa talked about Rosemary's Baby connection. So the curse continues. The curse continues, right? Well, there's more... More spirits there than, than just that, too, than those yeah. two. There's a lot that actually there's, live there's, there. There's actually quite a few there. Um, it's like the, the celebrity place to live if you live in New in York. New York. Yeah. So, but that's where he ultimately died. Um, he even claimed to have witnessed a ghost while he was living there, having sighted a crying woman walking towards him in the halls before she just disappeared. He was also a firm believer in the afterlife, once stating, quote, I'm an optimist about eternity. I believe in life after death. I believe that death is not the end but a beginning and I think that is an awesome quote that is a, that good, is quote. a good quote that's because yeah. it kind of is that's kind of like in line with the quote that Jamie had yep. yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Valentino, I have yeah. a question though have you guys ever noticed that it's crying women not crying men yeah yeah, because uh-huh. boys don't cry Just it's either children or women yeah yeah yep. but I don't know if I've ever heard a crying man ever yeah. really you don't make your husband cry. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think Terry. she's talking about in, in like in the ghost sense, though. I don't. Yeah, I don't think I've ever I've heard never, of. I don't I'm, think I've ever heard of that either. That it's never an EVP. No, it usually isn't. Um, no, they usually the the males tend to be more angry. If anything, yeah, yeah. is when you hear EVP. I don't know. That is a great observation. I also had an observation with just all these celebrities. You notice how it's usually the bigger iconic celebrities that everybody seems to have seen, like Elvis or John oh, Lennon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jim Morrison we'll talk about in a minute Um, Marilyn Monroe everybody's they always see the most famous ones right but you also gotta think they're the the most recognizable right nobody ever like claims to see Corey Haim's stunt double well they won't know who he is exactly they would claim they saw Corey Haim 
Yeah. Okay, but well, nobody ever claims to see Corey Haim. <laughs> well, that's true. But like all of the people that Jamie mentioned, right? If you showed me a picture of them and then you showed me, you know, pictures of like Marilyn Monroe and Elvis and, and John Lennon, I bet you could pick out those pictures over the ones that Jamie it's covered. It's who you're going to recognize. Mm-hmm. And if they don't have recon- if you don't recognize them. Yeah. But I have to wonder if there's some kind of wishful thinking to it. There's that. Could well, be. there's that too. Like, I mean, people run around and they're like, oh, I, that's so and so, right? And you're like, no, that's just some random dude. It's like, no, that's not Lord Mikey. That's Jason Alexander. <laughs> 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 um, so, anyway, we're talking about the famous Dakota in New York um, and his quote. Anyway, uh, according to his first wife, Cynthia, John received a letter from a psychic in 1966 that warned him that he would be shot while living in the USA. The prediction led him to develop an interest in spiritualism, and during a seance he attended, he was contacted by the spirit of his manager, Brian Epstein, who warned him that he would be shot. So he's had a couple warnings from psychics telling him he would be shot. Yeah. Yeah. While on vacation in Greece in 1969, an astrologer told John that he would be killed on an island. He returned home immediately, fearing that the astrologer was referring to a Greek island. His wife, Yoko Ono, came to realize years later that the prophetic astrologer was actually referring to the island of Manhattan. Uh, He was living in New York with his wife, Yoko Ono, at the time of his death. He was shot outside their apartment at the Dakota. On December 8th of 1980, his killer was Mark David Chapman. And it's always funny that people who like murders always have middle names in their names. Mark David Chapman. John John Wilkes Wilkes Booth. Booth. Mm -hmm. Lee Mm -hmm. Harvey Oswald. Always three names. Yeah. Yeah. Except for Sirhan Sirhan. Who's... Sirhan Sirhan. Did he kill Bobby Kennedy? Nobody oh, did. Yes, no. he, yes, yes. I digress. Yes, yes I he know. did. Yes, he did. He killed Robert you Kennedy. Digress? I digress. <laughs> yeah. No. No, I read that today. He, he, yeah, he killed Robert Kennedy. Yep. So, um, what's funny is, so he, he was shot in the back four times by Mark David Chapman. Lennon had earlier signed a copy of Double Fantasy for Chapman. I guess that was one of his albums that I'm not familiar with. Um, but uh, Chapman did plead guilty, guilty to his murder and was sentenced to life in prison. But the ghost of John Lennon has most commonly been seen in this New York residence. However, Oasis member Liam Gallagher uh, claims to have seen him. And that doesn't surprise me because Oasis, is, I believe, has a reputation for being completely high. Um, in 1983, two of the building's uh, residents there at the, at the Dakota... Joey Harrow and Amanda Moore saw John standing in the doorway where he was assassinated three years earlier. It was reported to have been an eerie lighting, looking as though he was lost in thought. Yoko Ono witnessed the ghost of her husband sitting at his grand piano in their apartment. He turned to her and consoled her, saying, Don't be afraid. I'm still with you. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. Former bandmate Sir Paul McCartney is convinced that John Lennon was present during the recording of the song Free as a Bird. It's a song that John wrote... And recorded in 1977, and then 15 years after his death, the three surviving Beatle members, Paul uh, McCartney, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr, they all reunited uh, to add their voices onto the track. And all three of the bandmates felt John's presence, and even claimed to have heard his name and his voice as the song faded out. Uh, There were a lot of strange going-ons in the studio, noises that shouldn't have been there, equipment doing all kinds of weird things. Uh, During the photo shoot that took place after the recording a rare white peacock stumbled onto the shooting, into the, 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 the photo shoot. And uh, while alive, John Lennon promised that he would send his loved ones a white feather to indicate that he passed away. Paul later stated, uh, he goes, I said it to the other guys, that's John, spooky, huh? It was like John was hanging around, and they felt that that was his way of participating in the recording. So John's son, Julian, also later said, you know, one thing that Dad said to me, should he pass away, uh, if there was any way of letting me know that he was going to be that everything was going to be okay, uh, he would come to me in the form of a white feather. So he had this thing with white feathers, I guess. And then something happened to him about ten to his son Julian about ten years uh, after his dad had died. Uh, he was on tour in Australia, and uh, he was presented with a white feather by an Aboriginal tribal elder, which definitely just took his breath away. Oh, that's and cool. He says, for one thing, for sure, the feather always represented peace to me. And he actually started a foundation called the White Feather Foundation in his father's honor, focusing on humanitarian and environmental issues uh, to make the world a better place, um, just as his father encouraged the world to do in his sit song, Imagine. Imagine. Mm-hmm. 
So uh, about the, that building, just a kind of Rosemary Baby building, the Coda. Um, it's supposed I haven't seen it, but it's apparently pretty impressive architecturally wise. How some of the world's most it's famous people got like a gothic. Uh, um, we'll post some pictures. House yeah. Judy Garland, Leonard Bernstein, and Lauren Bacall. Um, sci- some psychics held a televised seance there in 2006 in the Dakota building and other spots around uh, the world. So all kind of this big, massive seance. And they claim that John Lennon's ghost made an appearance uh, more than once to them. Yeah, and they're just, they're just so much, like, just the, the Hollywood, the celebrity stuff. There's so much drug use. There's so much alcohol abuse. Like, and it's, 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 it's interesting to think about this. A lot of sad people. A lot mm-hmm. of very wealthy, very sad, talented, people. and sad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so it's just it's just rough in that avenue. It's crazy, just like how deep these things in Hollywood go, and how long it's been going on. Yeah, and, and, and that's the thing. Like, just look at Hollywood. Look at the early Hollywood in the '30s. Mm-hmm. All of the tragedies, the murders, the deaths, the stuff that's happened. All of that, like, it still goes on today. Yep. It, it's just it's such a tragic environment um, but you know you gotta wonder though too like all of these sightings right like all of these famous people are being seen they're being seen in a lot of places that they went to that they hung out in all of that is it really intelligent that they're, that most people are seeing or is it something more residual it's just their energy is there possibly I think it could probably be both, both honestly yeah. but mm-hmm. they would also go back to those places that did make them happy yeah, the place where they were happy. So a lot of times it's the, the stage, because they love to perform. It was their personal life that was crap. Yeah, um, like I can see, I can see Jackson being at Neverland Ranch, like hanging out there. Like that's where he loved being. Yeah, Red Fox on stage. I mean, yeah, all, all of them. It just yeah. makes sense. Mm-hmm. And then even then, just the hotel places where you hang out with your friends. So I'm gonna haunt here. What's that? I'm gonna haunt here. This house? We're not going to be here by that time. That's where her friends are. <laughs> She's going to haunt us. Yep. That's okay. Yeah, you can we, do that. I, I think I've got a list of people I, I need to go. Uh... A growing list. <laughs> there, there's ones that I want to visit, and there's ones I want to scare. Right? Right? <laughs> right? I'm like, I'll make you a believer. And there's some where I just want to be a fly on the wall. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. Go to the White House. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we've been talking your ears off long enough. Uh, we really appreciate you guys uh, turning in. Tell your friends about the show, Paranormal Peeps Podcast. We're found on pretty much every podcast platform out there. Absolutely. Find us on Facebook. Find us on Instagram. Yeah, on Instagram, we're cold spot underscore research underscore parent. No, cold spot underscore paranormal underscore research. Absolutely. You can find us on YouTube as well at uh, cold spot paranormal research. And if you have any spooks going on in your house that you want us to come check out, we do have uh, we do go out and uh, investigate residences. And uh, if there's something there that you don't want there, we can get rid of it, and do our best on it, help identify what it is, and give you some answers, and hopefully set you at ease. Um, you, to do that, just find us at uh, paranormalhope.com. You got it. In the meantime, thanks for tuning in, and stay ghosty, my peeps. Thank you for listening to the Paranormal Peeps Podcast. You can find us on social media at Twitter at CPR Paranormal, on Facebook at Paranormal Peeps Podcast, and Cold Spot Paranormal Research. And you can find us on Instagram at Cold Spot underscore Paranormal underscore Research.